In Genesis chapter 22, we have the famous story of Abraham being called by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. But what's really happening here in this story? Did God really want Isaac to die? Was God really just messing with Abraham? Because some view this as some sick cosmic joke from God. When we dive deep into this chapter, it will all make much more sense, especially in light of Jesus. So let's jump into Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The test of Abraham, as we're about to see, follows the previous things found in the previous chapter, which if you remember Genesis 21, um, Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Isaac is born. Abraham deals with Abimelech and the water issue. And I wonder, are we just being given some chronological time marker here after these things? Then God said, or is this test of Abraham somehow related to what transpired earlier? And then Abraham saying, here I am, is making himself available to do the will of God. Just as we'll see Jesus says in Hebrews 10, 9, that he's come to do God's will, which is indicated by um, the that crucial moment of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that scene where he's found, you know, laying down his human will and submitting that to the will of the Father. He's come to do the will of God. And God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I, which I shall tell you. This story is easily one of the greatest foreshadows of Jesus. Jesus, his identity, Jesus' work as the exclusive and only Son of God. Jesus will actually use this very language in John 3, 16 and other places where he's referred to as the only begotten Son of God. And technically, Isaac is not Abraham's only son. Abraham has already given up his first biological son, Ishmael, in the last chapter. So whatever it means that Isaac is his only son, it's not about chronology. It's not about uh, physical birth order but it has to do with the kind of status or rank in the family. And Isaac was the only one that was promised to be the true heir of Abraham. With Jesus, he is the only true son and heir of God as the only begotten that the father promised would come. And we'll see lots of correlation between this story and Jesus. And then God tells him to go to the land of Moriah. This is not the first time Abraham has been called by God to go to a different land. As we've already seen, Abraham has been called several times to leave the place that he's been dwelling in. And so Abraham rolls early in the morning. There's no uh, nothing in the text that indicates frustration or confusion or, or pushing back and disagreeing. Abraham rose. He got up, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose and went to the place of which God told him. In other words, Abraham takes what is necessary to do what God told him to do. We've seen Abraham offer many different animal sacrifices to God thus far, but now he's not called to sacrifice an animal. He's called to lay down his very promised son, the life of his true heir, everything he's been waiting for. And as we've seen with most of Abraham's sacrifices, he's being called to go to a high place, a sacred space to offer gifts to God, which is the burnt offering. And on this specific mountain in the region of Moriah, weirdly enough, we're going to see later on in the scriptures that this is the place where the temple of God will be built, where the presence of God will dwell among his people, and the priests will do their spiritual ministry on behalf of the nation. And then it says, go to the place of which I shall tell you, in verse 2, that's something to really pay attention to, go to the place I'm going to tell you about, because... <laughs> God wouldn't even tell him the mountain until he gets near it. Just as God told Abraham originally at the first time God calls him, hey, go to a land I'm going to show you. Abraham's job is to make the journey and do what he's been told, and God will show him along the way. And Abraham's being called by God to go to a different mountain to experience this very different God who is not like the surrounding pagan gods. Those surrounding pagan gods of the nations, they take children as sacrifices. But as we're going to see, this God does not take. This God gives promises. This God gives life. This God does not demand human blood. And so we're going to see Isaac will end up being spared. Spoiler alert. But Abraham takes two of his young men right here. That's an interesting detail because God did not say to take two young men with him. Now, practically, you know, we ask why the need for two young men to come with him? Why are there two uh, instead of three or four? Is this just to, uh, the 
what Abraham in his old age would need um, to make the journey, to carry the stuff, to deal with what needed to happen over the course of those three days? Are they, are they there for protection? Because the last time Abraham was told to go to a different land, he ended up bringing Lot along with him. And God said, leave all your family, and he brought Lot. And is this a kind of similar situation where Abraham is just making sure he's got his own back and has extra security, something to lean on? Like, is this Abraham kind of making sure he um, takes care of himself? Uh, I don't know. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So this was a three days journey. And once Abraham saw the place, I'm sure you can imagine the kind of dread that likely came over him. And then he says to his young man, stay here with the donkey. So we at least know the young men are partly there uh, to watch the donkey. And he says, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. The donkey obviously couldn't bring them up the mountain, but only to the base of it. I think there's an image within that too. But Abraham is super confident. He says, we'll come back again to you. And you're like, Abraham, you're just trying to cover so Isaac doesn't know what you're doing. Did you really think Isaac would come back alive? Well, Hebrews 11 actually tells us Abraham believed God could even raise Isaac from the dead, which, metaphorically speaking, God did bring Isaac back from the dead. And so Abraham didn't know what God would do. He just knew what God could do. And then he says, we will go over there and worship, in verse 5, and come again to you. So in the mind of Abraham, what he's about to do in obedience is worship God, calling on God's name. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them together. I just like to um, suggest that the fire, the sharp weapon, the two uh, figures that are there is also possibly a, a link back to Genesis chapter 3. Think of the, fi the fiery flaming sword that turns every way and the cherubim that guard the way back into the garden, tree of life. I think there's something there. And I've touched on that in our series on John. You might want to go watch that. It's in John chapter 3. Um, I'll link that in the description below. It says, so they went both of them together. And I think Isaac has no idea. Based on what transpires, it doesn't seem as though Isaac knows what's happening. Abraham didn't go, hey, we're going to go on a journey. I'm going to kill you. You know, I don't think Isaac would have said yes to that. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. He said, here I am, my son. Remember, Abraham said, here I am to God after saying Abraham. He said, ah, oh, the fire and the wood are here. <laughs> Is Isaac getting a little antsy? But where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. This is emphasized twice. I'd just like to note that. Twice we're told that they went, both of them together. It's like, yeah, duh. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need that. So what is that emphasizing in the story? Technically, God provided Isaac. Okay, so when Abraham says God will provide for himself, technically he did. By giving Isaac to Abraham, he's given Abraham something to sacrifice. So Abraham was correct. But what Abraham didn't know is that God intended to provide something else for himself. And we're going to see later on that God can only provide for himself what is necessary for human sin's atonement, which is going to be his son. That's why John the Baptist will say, Behold the Lamb of God. This is God's offering. This is what only God could provide, his son. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. You're going to see another similar scene with Elijah on Mount Carmel having the battle between the gods. There's going to be a mountain high place with fire and wood and a sacrifice to call upon the Lord. There might be something to study within that too. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. That's the third time Abraham has said, here I am to God to his son, and now to the angel of the Lord. And he said, don't lay your hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know you fear God, seeing that you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The voice of God stopped the killing. And we see this as a contrast to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is the voice or the word of God personified, and his death wasn't stopped. Instead, he's given over to death as God's provision for humanity, 
as the one who makes atonement for our sin, and through his death we are given new life. In verse 12 it says, Don't lay your hand on your son, your only son. That's how the, the, the story opened earlier. Uh, Give your one and only son to me. It's in verse 1. He said, Abraham, take your son, your only son. And that seems to be something to pay attention to, the fact that Isaac is referred to in this way. Now, I have a question because he says, Now I know you fear God. Did God really not know up to this moment if God, if Abraham really feared him? Or has Abraham only just now made it outwardly evident in order to be rewarded, you know, that he actually truly fears God? By passing this test, was this so that God would know? Or was this so that Abraham could be rewarded? Or is it both? Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Jason. And I have some free gifts for you on our website at abovereproachministry.com. Maybe you want to learn how to study the Bible. We have free Bible classes just for you. Are you maybe a newer believer? Go ahead and check out our Christianity 101 Foundations course. Maybe you hate videos. Well, we have a podcast, so you can listen to all of our messages on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Maybe you want to join or start a discussion group. Check out our map of all the current armed discussion groups all around the world. And do you maybe live near Greenville, South Carolina? If you do, you should check out our church on Friday nights. Visit movementchurchsc.com for more information. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, or head over to the donate page and donate through debit or credit card, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, or even mail a check to P.O. Box 509 Inman, South Carolina. And if you want to make a ministry connection, feel free to reach out to me on our website. All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm done. So let's get back to the video. Verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. The last time he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw the mountain and was probably filled with dread. And behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Now remember, in the last story, Abraham or uh, Hagar, the Egyptian servant, she has her eyes open to see the provision of God in the well. Right? She sees that there's water that God has provided that she didn't previously see. And now Abraham sees what God has provided to spare his son. In the same way God spared the son of Hagar in the last story, Ishmael. I actually didn't consider that until just, just now. So the ram was caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So I wonder, the text does not actually have God explicitly commanding Abraham to sacrifice the ram. We're just supposed to look at this and go, supposedly Abraham's supposed to sacrifice it. But how did Abraham even know for sure what to do with that ram? Why was a sacrifice even required in Abraham's mind? Why did he think, well, instead of killing my son, something has to die here. Why did something have to be shed on that mountain or blood have to be shed on that mountain? And I think because Abraham knew what to do with this, even though he receives no command to sacrifice it, which is, which is interesting. Abraham just sees provision and then he assumes sacrifice. But it actually, the text never has God telling Abraham, sacrifice this. Just that, hey, go on the mountain and you're going to make a sacrifice. So either way, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide as it is to this day. And isn't that exactly what God does with his son in Jerusalem, where the temple is going to be built here later on, um, where Jesus will be outside the city given as a ransom for many. On the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. That's exactly what God does with his son. And so what God asks Abraham to give, he puts in his hand. Again, this is the very mountain where the temple of God will be built. And eventually Jesus will be given over to the people to condemn him to the cross. And truly on this mount, God provides later on for humanity. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn. So you're like, the angel... I thought this is just a messenger. I thought this is just as an angelic being sent from God. By myself, is this the angel delivering the message of God on behalf of God? Or is this the angel somehow... These are the questions we have, right? By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. Now, if this is why God is going to bless him in the way that he does here, which there's, of course, degrees of blessing, dimensions of blessing. What would have happened if Abraham did not give up his son and he wasn't willing to do it? Would all of this blessing end up just kind of withheld and locked up? Um, Did Abraham's future and the fullness of God's blessing depend on this moment of faithfulness? 
Or was this already worked in where God deemed him righteous earlier, made all these promises, knowing Abraham would? It just gets into the omniscience and sovereignty of God and the free will of man and, and all these different things. But he says, because you've done this, I will surely bless you. It's as if God takes the little that Abraham gives and multiplies the little Abraham brought. Because look, I'll bless you and multiply your offspring. Abraham was willing to give the one that God has given him. And God intends to take that one and multiply him into millions. Which I think we're supposed to see the image um, or rather the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the 20,000. Jesus takes a little bit and multiplies it into a lot. Or his body goes in the ground and that ends up being seed that bears fruit across time and history. And he says, I'll multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. That's the reference point. And as the sand on the seashore. Two reference points. The image of the stars is also a reference seemingly to the celestial cosmic rule of Jesus. That will eventually come through Abraham and his descendants, right? Jesus will have cosmic reign, a spiritual reign over all spiritual powers and physical human reign on the earth. And so if you remember, Joseph had two dreams. Joseph, the son of Jacob. He has one dream of the earth with the wheat, which represents each of him and his brothers. And then he has a dream of the stars and those celestial bodies represent him and his brothers and father as well. And so I think a reference to the stars and the sand um, that being of the land, it's humanity being from the dust of the earth, um, is going to, well, let me, let me say it how I wrote it down. Humanity is of the dust or from the earth, but the extent of our rule and blessing in Christ through faith even touches the cosmos and the heavenly places like Ephesians 1 says. We've been actually grafted into Jesus in Ephesians 2 so that we're seated in heavenly places with him above all rule and power and authority. And so what God, what God does is he takes what's of the dust and lifts it up um, to the highest station in his son so that where Christ is, we are. I think all these different images collide. It's not just land rule on the earth, but heavenly cosmic rule, which is what Jesus um, accomplishes. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And so I wonder, the Abraham's descendants are going to possess the gate of their enemies. There are a number of ways to possibly understand this. You know, here's some questions. Are these physical enemies humans that are being coming blessed uh, by, by coming in contact with Abraham and his descendants and the faith they have? Where like, you know, possessing the gate is actually transferring people from the kingdom of darkness and inviting them into the kingdom of light. Um, and us blessing, you know, or God blessing through his people, the world that doesn't know him? Or is this referring to the spiritual cosmic enemies of God and the gates of hell in that sense, which won't prevail against the church like Jesus says? Because this tells us that Abraham and his descendants will actually have enemies, and that's expected, but God won't necessarily prevent that from happening. So I think in verse 18, it says, In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because you've obeyed my voice. In other words, obedience because the becomes the avenue of blessing. It's like by obeying God, other people benefit and are blessed through that. God extends blessing through his people's obedience. And so through this offspring, his enemies will be conquered. But also on another level, whatever enemies decide to extend the hand of friendship to Abraham and his descendants, a.k.a. Jesus, those people will experience the blessing of God. And so this is the descendants of Abraham bringing blessing into the nations by their faith in God like Abraham had faith. And for those that don't want to receive the invitation, like Jesus sends his apostles out and says, extend peace where there's peace. And if there's no peace in that house, you know, withhold your peace and dust the, you know, shake the dust off your shoes against them. So is this that kind of image? Like either people can choose to be enemies and perish with um the gates of hell and be overtaken in that sense and be trucked over or they can choose to be a part of the kingdom um, and I think both are very uh, realistic possibilities here and it says Abraham returned to his young men and they arose went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba notice the emphasis on Abraham only remember how it says over and over they went up together or at least twice maybe I won't exaggerate over and over but it says a couple times they went up together. Uh, 
So they went, both of them together. So they went, both of them together. Right? This is, uh, I and the boy will go over there. Right? So the text has no problem telling us when Abraham and Isaac are going somewhere together, when they came to the place. Right? And the, the only reason I'm pointing that out is because the narrative ends with Abraham returned to his young men. Abraham went to Beersheba. Abraham lived at Beersheba. And I wonder why doesn't the text explicitly tell us Isaac went? Or if Isaac did not return with Abraham, why doesn't the text indicate what did happen with Isaac? Did this event possibly traumatize Isaac, disrupt their father-son relationship to the point that Isaac couldn't even live with his father anymore because of trust issues or fear or trauma or whatever? And I know that's reading a lot into this, presumably some of you would think that. But based on how the text has no problem telling us when Abraham and Isaac do things together and go places together, and the fact that verse 19 ends with just Abraham being referenced going back, you can say, well, he's the patriarchal head, so Isaac's assumed within that. I don't think so. I really do believe that as the next story opens, we're going to see Isaac is somewhere else. In verse 20, after these things, it was told to Abraham, behold, Milcah has borne children to your brother Nahor, which is really random, right? Uz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, all these names, these eight Milcah bore to Nahor. Nahor is Abraham's brother. Milcah is his wife, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, Ruma, bore Teba, Gaham, Tahas, Maka. Great names. But either way, the point is, this story ends with a son about to be sacrificed and being spared, and then Abraham's brother having children, or at least him being told that his brother has children. So who told Abraham this? Why do we care <laughs> that Nahor's wife and concubine have children? Why does Abraham need to know this? Why does it even matter for the story? And I think in the next chapter, it's going to become pretty clear. We're going to meet Isaac's wife. We're going to see how Isaac ends up after this in contrast to what just took place in this chapter. There's going to be a difference in relationship and where he lives, it seems. And... I'll say, let me say this for those that are wondering, like, where's Jesus in this? I did a much longer message on this story and, and connected that to Jesus in John chapter 3. And if you'd like that deep dive breakdown of how this chapter foreshadows Jesus and shows us Jesus, you can find that in the video description below or on the outro screen or just go to our John series and you'll find it's on the John chapter 3 verse 16 episode. Um, but go check that out. It'll be way more informative much deeper in terms of connecting Isaac with Jesus in these two stories. Um, and either way, that's Genesis 22. So I'll see you guys in the next Bible study on Genesis chapter 23. Hey, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more biblical content just like this. We have hundreds of videos, but you might be most interested in these ones right here. Also, visit our website for all of our free resources and classes. And thank you so much for partnering with us financially to make this ministry even possible. Keep moving towards Jesus, and I'll see you in the next video.